When people talk about Luis Urea as a border writer, he objects with good reason, think, saying that he is not interested in borders, but bridges. He is a novelist, a poet, a documentarian, a journalist, and an activist. And for decades, both as a person and as an artist, he has knitted together cultures in a way that makes them legible, that makes them important, and makes them impactful for all of us. And we are extraordinarily grateful for that. He is here, well, partly to talk together in, in front of you, and also for a performance on Saturday night at 7.30 in the Mandeville Auditorium of a new version, a kind of radical new version, of the uh, Igor Stravinsky classic work, Histoire du Soldat, which is receiving its 100th birthday this year. And as a part of its birthday present, we're completely redoing it. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and uh, that means that we've taken the original text by Ramuz, which is a very fine text, uh, but we are, for this performance, at least discarding it and replacing those words with Luis's poems from Tijuana Book of the Dead. Yeah. <laughs> and I think that is a fantastic idea. Uh, the dance collective from Tijuana, Lux Boreal, will join us, as will the improvising flutist Wilfrido Terrasas for an extraordinary evening. I hope if you haven't thought about coming to join us, I hope you will do so. It will be really, really a lot of fun. Um, Luis is the recipient of a number of awards and recognitions. He is a Pulitzer Prize finalist in 2005 for his 2004 nonfiction account of, uh, called The Devil's Highway, a, a story of a, of a family of Mexican immigrants lost in the Arizona desert. His 2009 novel, Into the Beautiful North, is a big read selection by the National Endowment for the Arts and has been chosen by 50 different cities as a community read. There are, the list is long, and I think we could fill the time talking about Luis's accolades, but can I tell you that for me, more important than any of those awards is who he is as a person. He is the combination of a total badass and a guy with a heart of gold. <laughs> and if there is anything that's gonna get us out of this mess, it's Luis Urea and people like him. <laughs> so would you please welcome him? Wow. <laughs> Thank you for being here. <laughs> Where to start? One, I think we should start by telling you that Luis and I spent the day together mm. uh, in rehearsal. So if it feels like we've begun a conversation four or five hours ago, that's actually not just an illusion, it's a point of fact. Uh, and, but I think the one thing we didn't talk about that I've enjoyed talking to you about, uh, about with you in previous conversations is a little bit about your biography and just a little bit about how we arrived here at this point and where you came from, where you were born, what your early life was like, and, and, and what makes Luis Urrea from that standpoint? And I'm gonna take a sip of water and I'm gonna, <laughs> I'm gonna eagerly await the response. It's tequila, man. Watch yourself. <laughs> Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. We're done. No. <laughs> yeah. I was born in Tijuana. Uh, you know where the main drag turns left and heads towards the dog track, Revolución. I was born there above a, a little drugstore, a little botica. I'm from Colonia Independencia, if there are any Tijuanans. Oh! People know good stuff here. <laughs> yes, they do. <laughs> from Rampa Independencia. The house was Rampa Independencia Mil Dos. Uh -huh. Still there. Fantastic. If anybody's uh, into the Beautiful North fan, the, the model for Atomico, the world's super gangsta cholo, was actually my cousin, Hugo. <laughs> <laughs> Is that right? <laughs> Atomico is a great character. Thanks. Fantastic Thanks. character. Imagine being his cousin. <laughs> I can't imagine. Um, no. And Hugo, he truly is the badass. Hugo talks like this, okay? <laughs> right? He talked like this when he was seven. <laughs> <laughs> you know those guys? I always <laughs> joke on the road that he was the first person in the family to grow a zapata mustache, like when he was 11. <laughs> he had two whiskers, you know? <laughs> Orale! Um, and that was, a, that was a, you know, to me, Tijuana was Wonderland. Yeah. You know, it was where my, we lived in a house with my grandma, my aunts, my cousins, a bunch of dogs, my mom and my dad. And most of you know, my father was from Sinaloa. 
Rosario, Sinaloa. My mom was from Manhattan <laughs> and was sort of a, a blue blood socialite who, through some weird alchemical process, met my dad, fell in love, married him, and then rushed off to old Mexico. And I always imagine my mom thinking, well, I'm going to the Hacienda. Yeah. <laughs> you know? Anthony Quinn and Gilbert Rowland will be there. And that'll be gauchos, perhaps, from Argentina. <laughs> and, and that wasn't the case? No. <laughs> no. And uh, in those days, the rampa wasn't paved even. It was yeah. dirt, you know? And, and I think she, she had a really hard time. It was really shocking to her, um, her new life. Um, and, you know, it's hard for me to express how awesome it was to be there. Mm. Um, but there was so much, if you know, those of you who know La Independencia will know this, but it was a place where everything was possible. We had this insane dirt street full of rocks and boulders, and you had to drive really slowly because it would tear out the bottom of your car if you hit them hard. But at the end of our street that came out down around above 9th Street near the police station. But on the hill up above the rampa, there was a castle, mm. right? It's still there. Mm. And some, you know, being, being Mexico, the guy painted it yellow. <laughs> so there's a castle painted yellow with battlements and stuff. That was incredible. And halfway down the rampa, in, in, a, in a kind of a John Irving detail, there was a house at the bottom of the hill and they had a bear. <laughs> <laughs> and it was chained to a tree. And it just sat there, a very depressed bear. And Hugo would save the old tortillas. Mm. And then every once in a while he'd say, Luchi. He used to call me Luchi. I wanted a macho name, you know, like El Frankenstein or El Lobo. <laughs> Luchi. Luchi, you want to feed the bear? <laughs> and I'd say, yeah, and we'd go down and he would fly tortillas like Frisbees to this poor bear and it would catch him, you know, and then eat him and it would wave, which makes me think it was like a circus, but it was mm, trained to yeah. do tricks. Yeah. You know, come on. There was nothing in Claremont that could match that no. kind of thing. <laughs> I'm here to tell you this still is not. No. <laughs> <laughs> so that was all really interesting and I, you know, everything about it was, was amazing to me. And then I got sick. Tuberculosis took out all kinds of people in the yep. neighborhood, you know, the early 50s or oh, the mid 50s. And uh, I got extremely sick. And, uh, you know, I not only had tuberculosis, but as my body broke down, I got all these other yep. diseases, which my mother saw as poverty diseases. I had, I had tuberculosis, German measles, scarlatina, and some other things all at once. And, um, you know, that's how I came to San Diego, because my parents wanted to get me out of, of the barrio. Um, and we first landed in National City, but we made our, our, our home in this little apartment on National Avenue in Logan Heights. Right. Straight down, by the way, National Avenue from Juan Felipe Herrera, America's first Chicano poet laureate. Right. Um, we didn't know each other, but, you know, we were different ends of, of Logan. And um, it's really funny because it was a tough time in Logan Heights. There was a lot of race trouble and, and d unrest. And um, just to show you how San Diego has changed. So our, our, I have several kids, and, and our youngest kid, Rosario Chayo, um, I'd been telling her about my, my, my rough days, you know. I had a rough time, street life, you know. And so we had her here, we drive her down, and I'm preparing her. Now, wait a minute. We're going back to the hood. Prepare yourself. And we drive into the hood, and there are people jogging. <laughs> <laughs> and there's a Starbucks, right? That's right, exactly. It's next to the Bottega Veneta. Uh, <laughs> right, and I said, just wait till you see our apartments, man. And we drove down there, and they're all like Miami Vice pastels with palm trees. And she said, hardcore dad. <laughs> and the only thing I could do to defend myself was, when I was a kid, if you was running down the street, you were being chased by cops, man. She was like, nah, nah, no. nah. <laughs> So everything gentrified. And then can you tell me just a little bit about, 
you know, your life in Sinaloa, you had almost a double, a double life in, in Sinaloa, in, 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 in northern Baja, and also in, in San Diego. So yeah. this was also part of your childhood, yeah. right? Yeah. Well, you know, Sinaloa, it, it's interesting. Um, uh, in fifth grade, we moved to Claremont. And I could not believe it. Some, so a couple of things happened. And one of those was being taken to Mexico for my various extended stays mm -hmm. in Sinaloa. One of the things that I was astounded by when we got to Claremont is y'all have lawns. I was like, Would you people up here have big green lawns? I thought people were rich, right? Yeah. How do they spend money putting grass, water on grass? The second thing I discovered was sliced bread. That was awesome. People don't believe me out in the world, but I tell them, man, if you're like me, you grew up eating peanut butter sandwiches on corn tortillas, man. Right? La peanut butter. Right? And you'd put it in a hot tortilla, and the freaking peanut butter would melt. <laughs> right? And this is how you ate it. Am I wrong? You'd be like, mm -hmm. <laughs> And then they brought yeah. Wonder Bread out, and I was like, dang. Yeah. It's the coolest thing I'd ever seen. It's still pretty good, yeah. But, yeah, it's, yeah. yeah. Sliced bread is awesome. Yeah. So, um, so I was, I, and, and it's interesting because in Logan, I still had, you know, my Tijuana accent. Hablaba así, man, you know, Spanglish, mm. right? People's wives were their wife, uh, and <laughs> you had a bike, era una bica. Cake era un cakey. <laughs> Except the old ladies would make it a little cakey, so they'd call it un cakeycito. <laughs> ¿Quieres un cakeycito? Right? And then I got to Claremont, <laughs> and they had no idea what to make of yeah. that. And I realized as survival, I. I left my dad's accent and took on my mom's. Uh, and I started speaking like this. <laughs> you know? Um, and my father, I think, felt like he was losing the Mexican war. Mm. The war in my house was the US versus Mexico at all times. And one of the reasons I'm a border writer is because the fence went right down the house. <laughs> Serious. Yeah, no. In the kitchen, I was Luis. In the living room, I was Luis or Cabron. <laughs> <laughs> and they both wanted me to be the perfect citizen of the opposite country. Yes. So I had to speak well, you know. And my dad realizing, I think that I was I was fast becoming un hippie. Mm -hmm. and he didn't like the war it. was being won in the opposite direction. Uh, you know, because you think my education was in the U.S. Right. Movies, TV shows, music, books, comic books. The stuff that drove him insane, famous monsters of Filmland magazine, mm. Mad magazine. They thought, guess it's the movie, you know? So my dad started these long, several month residencies in Sinaloa. <laughs> and the first one of those, I was 14, and we took a 27 hour bus ride, right? And my dad blew my mind forever. In fact, it's in the author's notes in the new book. He gave me the Godfather. He said, Mijo, lee esto. Te va a cambiar la vida. Hmm. I was like, really? And I started reading, and I had never seen anything. And it did, that's right. It did. Yeah. Um, and this amazing experience of suddenly living in Sinaloa, hmm. you know, and going out to the mango. The family had a mango huerta, and we'd go there at dawn and knock mangoes out of the tree and that's our, you know, for breakfast. And there were huge iguanas everywhere. And I was in love every three seconds, right? Mm. And one of the miracles for me was my uncle owned the movie theater. It's the movie theater that's in, into the beautiful right. north, that's Cine Pedro Infante. And I'd go to the movies all, like every two nights there'd be a new <laughs> double or triple feature. Mm -hmm. And my uncle owned the radio station and he hated rock and roll music. So he would save up all the rock and roll 45s that they'd send him and he'd give me a box of them. <laughs> and then I'd infect his house with Led Zeppelin and you know, Credence. Did you um, have cachet as, the, as a person from California, uh, for example, understanding all those lyrics and being able to teach the kiddos <laughs> and stuff like that? I mean, did, did, yeah. was that part of like... Yeah, my, my cousins were insane for the Beatles. Uh -huh. Los Beatles. <laughs> <laughs> right. And they didn't speak any English. So they were learning <laughs> you everything whatever you phonetically. Wanted to yeah. Right. Yeah. yeah. And we would get up on, they would sit on a roof 
<laughs> drinking yeah. and singing Beatles, you know, hey, bungalow big, what did you kill? Bungalow big. And they'd say, oye, ¿qué es un bungalow big, eh? And I'd say, pues es un vaquero. Oh, uh -huh. right? Um, and that was, you know, and then they would, they would give me, because I hadn't heard Mexican pop. Right. Or Mexican rock music. So it became this cultural interchange. And then we would go on these long journeys with my uncle. He had a big, nowadays you'd get killed, but in those days he had a huge white Ford LTD that said press in the windshield. Mm. <laughs> and everybody would make way for him. And we would go to these towns and he would look for the newspaper office and find the publisher of every newspaper. Yo soy Carlos Ubar de Rosario, Sinaloa. Ah, you know. And they would show us like the background of all the cities. It was a great education for me. So you were really plugged into the royalty of, of Sinaloa, the, the... Accidentally, I yeah. was, yeah. That's right. Yeah, and I went from, you know, Mr. Mr. Terror of Poverty Boy to going down there, and I, it blew my mind. I'd never wow. seen anything like it, you know? An amazing I liked thing. It. Yeah. And, and I'd like to maybe work through a couple of your, of your, uh, of your books and, 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 and even some uh, poems and articles. I mean, the first thing I read of yours uh, was Across the Wire, which I thought was just extraordinary. Thanks. And, uh, and so before I read Into the Beautiful North, Hummingbird's Daughter, and, and the other things which came along to fill in the picture of Luis Urrea as novelist and then, <laughs> and then as poet, I thought of you in, initially as a, as a journalist, as a sort of, mm. as a reporter and as an, as an activist. And so I, I'm, I'm not sure if that was the first thing, but it was only the first thing that I read. So where does, where does that, that book and those articles, which because they were printed in the, in the reader, were they not? Uh, where did that come in your, in your life as a writer and how important was that actual real contact with real people as opposed to fictional characters for your development? Um. Well, anybody here that I went to high school with will know I was the guy with the notebook, mm -hmm. you know, and I was always writing poems and stories. And being a poor boy, I was astonished to realize that Stephen King had gotten, you know, in those days, $400,000 advance mm -hmm. for a book. And I thought, mm. <laughs> but I was so stupid or naive that I thought, if I just write the coolest love poem to my girlfriend, yeah. I'm gonna be a rich man. You know, I'll be like Led Zeppelin. They'll have an Urea jet that says Luis on it. And I'll, you know, it's ridiculous. And um, I, I was big in the drama department. I, I went to Claremont High, Ridgemont High. Um, and uh, I was a, a theater kid. And I, I came to UCSD, our beloved UCSD. Uh, as a theater major, mm -hmm. and then went over to the dark side and started doing writing. Um, and uh, in my senior year, this is a roundabout answer, but it's yeah. the answer. In my senior year at UCSD, my dad died at the, in the hands of Mexican cops. And it was a really awful experience uh, for all of us. And uh, the, the capper of the awful death that he had is that they sold me personally, his corpse. They wouldn't let us bury him if mm -hmm. I did. And uh, I had come into money he was bringing home that they didn't find. Um, and we used that to buy his body. And then my niece and nephew over here, their dad, my brother Juan, and I and my, my brothers and sisters, we took up a collection to, to bury my dad. Yeah. And uh, at that time, we had to bury him in a, an unmarked grave in Tijuana. It's hard. Yeah. That was my senior year, man. And then I had to go back to school. And I thought, what do what I do? What do you do with do that, do? John? Yeah. So I didn't know how to express myself except in writing, mm. ultimately. And I wrote a piece about his death and these horrible kind of jolting dreams I kept having about him that were so vivid that it felt like he was coming back. The first one, he came back and didn't know he was dead. And he kept saying, what, what happened to me? What happened to me? And I, I knew in that dream, if I lied, I could keep him. Mm. I could fool him. And I had to tell him, you're dead. It was really harsh. Anyway, um, so I wrote it. 
and I was in a writing workshop, or I was friends with a writing workshop leader who's since gone back to Boston. Um, and he had conspired with the university to bring Ursula Le Guin mm -hmm. in as mm -hmm. a workshop leader. And he told her my story, and he gave her the piece. I typed it up on mimeograph masters. It was mimeograph to show you. And he gave it to her, and she invited me into the workshop. Um, and that was the beginning of the writing life, Ursula. And that piece, and then she published it in an anthology. It was my first sale. And so, you know, in a lot of ways, my father gave his life to give me everything good that would happen thereafter. Um, all that being said, I graduated, and I didn't know what to do with myself. Um, I was really lost, I think. Um, and we were plunged into insane hopelessness and poverty because the insurance company, he, he was pushed off a highway and then manhandled. Um, the, the insurance company wouldn't pay us his life insurance or his auto insurance because there was no proof. Even though we had pictures of the wreck, they say, said it could be any wreck. Mm. And I ended, ended up having this really weird male duel with the chief of police in that town. It got really, I was just a kid, I didn't know. Um, so I didn't know what to do with myself and I was searching for meaning like people do. And for a while I, I was a movie extra. Yeah. Because hey, Southern California, right? What do you do? Let's go be in the movies. Um, and I was really lucky that way. I, I got to do some really wonderful stuff. I, I got to extra in a Chuck Norris movie. So, <laughs> yeah, I use that for fake cred, you know. <laughs> Tijuana, Chuck Norris, people. <laughs> Enough said. Enough said. Yeah. Um, but during that period, some friends of mine had been going to Tijuana with a missions crew. Right. And I was not really interested in, especially because they were Baptists. I was like, are you kidding? Not me, man. And uh, I had my movie extra, long blonde hair and all this stuff. And it was led by, I'm sure some of you knew him, Pastor Vaughn, this amazing, oh, yeah. yeah. well-known pastor in town who was a, 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 I used to tell him he was a Zen Baptist instead of a Zen Buddhist. <laughs> um, and at the same time then, I started working with Vaughn I got a job as a bilingual TA at Mesa College with the great Cesar Gonzalez, who, so I had these two kind of mentors, one extremely conservative, one liberal, one hardcore Baptist, one hardcore Jesuit. So it was kind of a nice bifurcated path, you know, yeah. of service. And um, that's what I did, I, 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 you know, when I was, not in Tijuana with the poor. I was with Cesar, with Chicanos, and you know, uh, what now be called dreamers. Um, and Vaughn knew because I was, I think, a little movie starred out, and he, he didn't like that much. And so the first day when he, he took me to the Tijuana garbage dump to meet the garbage pickers, and he said, I have a job for you if you're humble enough to do it. And I was at that point in life where I would be like, yeah, I'll show you who's humble, pal. I'm the humblest man there ever was. <laughs> um, and I said, of course I'm humble enough. What is it? And he put out a tub, and they filled it with hot water, and he put a bar of ivory soap in it. And he said, you're going to thank me there's ivory soap in there because it floats. And I was like, what? And then the garbage picker started lining up. And they took their shoes off, and I ended up kneeling in the garbage, washing feet. Mm, mm -hmm. Oh, Vaughn, infernal old man. And uh, at first I was like, yeah, I'm blessing these people, man. I'm so, I'm so righteous right now, you know? And uh, it didn't take long for me to realize they were blessing me. They were giving me their wounded feet. Yep. Their, and uh, I, I cried, I cried the whole time. 150 people. Yeah. And I just, and I couldn't move, I was sore, you know, and he was very pleased with himself. <laughs> um, you know, one of the things about that, the, um, the, the book that we were talking about across the wire right now is, is harsh. It is 
sometimes really difficult to read. The story of your father, of course, I knew from, from the book. I knew the stories of, about the garbage pickers. I know about Negra. I know about all of those things from your book, which in many ways lead into the other, yes. the other work. But what I, what I love about it and what I love about your other work and actually what I love about our project now is that when you have something which is fundamentally horrifying, that within that there is this this kind of warm glow of joy. And when you have something that is, that could be on the surface seen as, as simple and unproblematic, and you poke out a little bit, you'll find a kernel of melancholy. And it feels like those two things are plugged into one another. My question about, about that book, but then going on to the other work, I'm, I'm thinking especially of Into the Beautiful North, is how, how subversive is your characterization of those characters? How, how much are you playing with our preconceptions versus <laughs> what we are actually seeing? It's all subversive, man. <laughs> Come on. Um, yeah, I mean, particularly in, in Into the Beautiful North, mm -hmm. I thought, I would like to write a kind of a pop novel, and I would like to make all the heroes in that novel people that everybody attacks or looks down on in this culture right mm. now. And uh, you know, I was really thinking how interesting it would be to have a group of undocumented young women seeking help because narcos had invaded their towns and all the men were gone. But they secretly, at least the leader of that group is looking for her dad who came to the U US and never came back. But how much more interesting would it be than to add a young gay Mexicano Mm, Tacho. Tacho. Yeah, I love who Tacho. Who hopes to marry Johnny Depp, you know? Um, <laughs> and then at the Tijuana garbage dump, they meet Atomico. Mm -hmm. And to have these people come to the U.S. and try to outwit the Border Patrol and racists and angry Mexicans and all this stuff they meet, how subversive would that be to have somebody on their princess cruise the big Mai Tai <laughs> rooting for these guys to get away? Yeah. Or for Tacho to get a boyfriend? Sure hope he gets a man. Yeah. <laughs> um, I thought that would be cool. And it happens, right? Well, it does happen. I think it does, it right? Does. Exactly. Yeah, Tacho hooks up. Now, you know, Tacho is a real person. I mean, he's inspired by a real person yeah. named Tacho mm -hmm. from Rosario Sinaloa. And I watched this young man who was, as far as I knew at the time, the only gay citizen of this little town, or certainly the only out gay citizen back when I was a kid. And uh, he survived by making himself so out, yeah. so in your face, that they would back off. They're like, so okay, you know? Yeah. They called him Tachito el Machito. <laughs> and he would put them down, yeah. man. And, um, and I, I used to watch him from a distance because my family wouldn't let me meet him. <laughs> I had like love beads and hair. They're like, no, this was those no. <laughs> did, does he? Did he? Does he like his representation? <laughs> I mean, how how does he feel about being in the book? Well, uh, he and I met in 1980, mm -hmm. so a lot of the a lot of his kind of jokes and mannerisms are from hanging out with him in 1980. But, uh, and I once told him, I, I, when I first met him, I said, Tacho, man, I've been watching you since 1970, de veras. I said, I te quiero, cabrón. He said, de veras. <laughs> <laughs> Así no, pero si te quiero. Así no. <laughs> um, and so when the book came out, then the Spanish edition came out, and my cousins from Rosario <laughs> took him a copy. Ah, so he's, he, he knows it. Yeah, right? they said, we're taking Tacho a copy of the book. And then there was a silence, you know, I was like, nah, 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 nah. <laughs> and so I finally wrote to my cousin Enrique, who's a Mexican ambassador, and I, we call him El Emba. And I said, Emba, what happened? What did Tacho say? And he said, oh, Tacho's become insufferable. <laughs> <laughs> he carries it around, he says to people, <laughs> Les dije, eh? Yeah. I told you I was special. Um, and I think he was amused. And then uh, about six months later, a message came from Tacho. And he said, I think you owe me some royalties. <laughs> I was like, well, it's not you. I don't even know your last name. But you, you know, I'm, I'm giving you an homenaje. Um, and Nayeli. This is a fantastic character. She's Negra's daughter. Ah. Uh... She's on Facebook. Dale una face, you Facebookers. She's on Facebook. Yeah. 
And uh, I wanted well, the to share. Uh, I'm sorry to interrupt, but the story of her birth at the end of that uh, of that book is extraordinary. So, some of you may not have read these things, and you may wonder what we are talking about. But first of all, do yourself a favor and read those those extraordinary books. That's right. Do my bank account a favor. Yes, and please do. <laughs> And, uh, and so the, the, the three that comprise the sort of uh, the, 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 the Holy Trinity of the, into the beautiful north, the, they actually come from different places because mm. Nayeli yeah. comes from Tijuana. I mean, in the, at least it's modeled on someone from Tijuana and mm. Tacho somebody from Sinaloa. And Atomico also from Tijuana, right? Uh, from, from the well, junkyards. Well, he was originally from Sinaloa. Oh, from Sinaloa, excuse yeah, me. But yeah, but the, 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 I mean, the real model for Atomico. Mm -hmm. A little bit of trivia you might enjoy, uh, Hugo, his last name is Hugo Millan Urrea, right? His dad's name was Millan, and Urrea is his mom's name, my tia Leti, known as Tia Flaca. And uh, what's interesting about that name, Millan, is that y'all know the family on American Trash TV as Caesar Millen, the dog whisperer. Oh, wow. Es Millan, hombre. <laughs> He's from Sinaloa. He's related. <laughs> to my cousin, Ugo, and he came here undocumented. Uh-huh, so some, when, I'm, <laughs> when I'm out there talking to the world, and yeah. I always tell them, if you think the American dream doesn't work, just imagine this, a guy from Sinaloa, undocumented, his only skill was talking to dogs, <laughs> came to the US and he's a multimillionaire now. <laughs> Come on! Mean, I know, what am I doing wrong? Yeah, right. Um, but, uh, so yeah, those, 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 uh, those characters all are from all over, and they, they have input. Because you live, I think if you're a writer, you live in a great society of souls, right? Yeah. They're, they're around you, and you want to represent. And, uh, you know, the reality, you asked earlier about sorrow and humor, it's just that we're funny. We're funny. We're all funny. You know, in Devil's Highway, I had to work my way into the Border Patrol, and I was terrorized. Those guys, who we were they hard on me at first? And I realized they were having a great time. It was one of the funniest things they'd ever seen, me in terror, you know? <laughs> but they were also testing to see what kind of person I was. Right. Could they trust me? Could I take it? Right. Was, I, was I a good guy or not? Right. It's a big deal to be a good guy. And uh, at, you know, there was a certain point when Grace came in the room where you could see those men decide, you know, you could really hurt me and maybe ruin my career, and I'm going to trust you anyway. And I felt responsible to them then, whatever my differences with them were. And I think that happens all across the board with the characters, that I, I, I don't want to misrepresent them. Um, so you know, you can have fun with stereotypes. There's, I would say, one stereotypical, in my opinion, character on purpose in all the group in Into the Beautiful North, and that's one of the girlfriends on the trip. She's sort of like a, 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 a control in a science experiment. I see. Right? right? This is what sort of a small town, middle class girl might think when all of her friends are so extravagant and wild. Like She's like, mm -hmm. calm a little bit, you know? Um, the aunt in the book, Tia Irma, is our Tia Irma, mm -hmm. Mexico's bowling champion. She was Mexico's first national bowling champion. It's a Tia Irma. She died at, I think, 95 while bowling, so. Yeah, let's hear it for that. That's the way to go, man. Yeah, absolutely. Don't you want to just be conducting and then keel one day? I want to be typing, just I say, I feel oh, like that every now and then. <laughs> Do what you love. It doing. sometimes feels closer than you know. Yes. Uh, <laughs> yeah. I wonder if we could tie this conversation into the events that we're doing this, this week. Because this, is, this, this conversation takes place in, the, in a context. And that context is a, is a, is a celebration of art and music and, and literature right. uh, about this place. And you know, we're calling this festival, it's about time. But it's also about place and it's about our, the way we look at place. And, and you and I t talked at length today, and I think many people in this room know that uh, last Saturday we took uh, 75 percussionists uh, to the border 
and had a performance of John Luther Adams' magnificent piece called Inuxuit, where roughly half the percussions, percussionists were on the Tijuana side and roughly half on the, on the United States side. And we could not see each other, but we could hear each other. And the rehearsals were, were held, the rehearsal, I should say, was held just before the performance by leaning into that fence and speaking quickly to people and having the word sort of propagate out. <laughs> and uh, it was one of the most extraordinary things. I've never been involved in an ensemble piece where if you wish to walk from one end of the ensemble to another, you needed a passport. Wow. <laughs> you didn't, to walk from the first wow. violins to the tuba, normally you don't need a passport. <laughs> no, you don't. And, uh, and it was just absolutely extraordinary. And so that, in a way, was half, always for me, half of the scenario of what we were talking about. The other half is what we'll do on Saturday with you, and those are, the, those are the bookends for me, which root this experience that we're having in San Diego to a broader cultural context. Right. When I first came to UC San Diego, I'll say, and I think with some shame, that there were lots of international connections amongst my colleagues, both in the music department and beyond, but they all, were all to Paris or to Berlin, or, and that's still very often the case. And literally, and I'm sorry to say not to sound too much like Sarah Palin, but I, I, from the end of my street, I can see Mexico. <laughs> <laughs> and, <laughs> is it, isn't it about time we started making art together, right? Yeah. And, uh, and so I'm really so pleased to have, in the context of this wonderful festival that I've put together with my colleagues in the San Diego Symphony, the chance to engage with you, and I, I wonder, first of all, what does it feel like uh, to have your work transposed with this music which was actually made without, first of all, Stravinsky sitting in Switzerland, relatively calm and placid in the middle of carnage. The First World War is raging around him, and he is sitting in this kind of calm place, writing a piece about a soldier who sells his soul to the devil in exchange for a violin. One of the things that made me want to change that text out is, is that in the time of war, this is a very kind of happy-go-lucky story. I thought, well, this guy didn't have cannons going off down, down his street. So is there some version of that uh, selling your soul? Or is there some modern version of being a warrior that we could find? And I have to tell you, I think I've told you this, but when I read Into the Beautiful North and I read the character of Nayeli, I thought, now that is a warrior. This is a warrior who left Sinaloa, crossed in the United States, drove with Tacho, sick as a dog, to Chicago to find her father, and she did. Now that's the kind of warrior that stands for the early 21st century, not some sort of fictitious soldier. That's our soldier. And so we've transposed your poetry into this story about that simultaneously about Faust, selling your soul, and also about what it means to be a warrior these days. And I wonder, does it feel like it fits today? You've had a little bit of an experience with the rehearsal. And feel free just to let me have it if it doesn't work. <laughs> well, it's good for you I'm so brilliant, because. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, this is what I was telling Brenda all afternoon, <laughs> because you are, indeed. I felt so self-conscious. And I kept going to Cindy, my wife's here. I kept going, do I look really stupid up there? <laughs> no, no. You know, because there's a lot of movement going around and a lot of um, trying to read my poetry in the dark, trying not to trip over stairs. And we'll have better light for you tomorrow. Man, I was like, I kept saying, I'm going to fall down. I'm going to fall down. Um, but I think it's, it's kind of, I mean, we've, we, we hung out in uh, yeah. Anaheim chatting over some incredibly delicious junk food one day. Yes, we did. Um, so we've talked about some of this, but you know, I, I, uh, part of the thing about my upbringing was music, constant mm. music. And to be able to take part in this musical and this dance-related performance that's going to make people think anew, see anew, means everything to me, because this is the gist of everything I've tried to do. And I told you when I, when I wrote the, the new novel, I was thinking of Respighi, of all people. Right. You know, I was thinking about, um, though I love the Pines of Rome more, I was thinking about the Fountains of Rome. And a lot of the energy of the book, including the quiet coda at the end, is, is stolen from that composition as best I can. So what moves me about Aside from the various devil marches in it, yeah, right. What we're doing, that's pretty good. That's pretty good. It <laughs> kicks up the heavy metal side of me. But um, 
what really moves me, I think, in it is that, particularly as we started the conversation a while ago, it was based on Beautiful North and it moved to the poetry. Right. But the whole point of Into the Beautiful North was writing a heroine's journey instead of a hero's journey. Writing a Joseph Campbell classic warrior's journey for a 19-year-old woman. Right. Because it was time. And it's hard to find those concepts moved over unless you see, you know, Mad Max Fury Road or something and, you know, Imperator Furiosa is killing all the bad guys with her truck. But I, I, I wanted to do all of those things that are embodied in this piece of music, the, 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 the perilous night journey. You know, the, there's even a trip to the underworld yes. and there are terrible deals one must make to get to, to what you need to get to. Not only, I think, to save yourself, but to save your people. And uh, when you told me what you were doing, what you were thinking, I just flipped out because I thought, yes, that's fantastic. You know, putting this concept of borders into a new perspective. And what do they mean? What do they really mean? And what do they mean to the person who's lucky enough to be on the first world side of, and the person who's not? And the phenomenon of the Mexico border with the United States is astonishing when you think about it, that you know, these cultures are, are, are together and most borders don't have major cities mirroring each other right. all the way along the border. They keep them separate, right. not, you know, we're right together. Um, and it's ancient. Well, this is, uh, thank you for, I mean, you're, you're leading me exactly where I was thinking, uh, say, about a year ago when I was thinking about this, this, this process, because I was thinking about a kind of ancient Greek ideal, which is that there are warriors and wanderers, and <laughs> that they really are often confused for one another, and that where they, they are, there's a synergy between the two. I mean, you think of Homer, yes. but you also think of the, 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 the phalanx, and they're, they're the same kind of thing. And what, what came to me was waking up early, every day in our, frankly, Tony La Jolla uh, suburb and seeing women arriving in our neighborhood at six o'clock in the morning to clean people's houses and realizing that it wasn't just in our neighborhood, that there were people arriving at restaurants in downtown San Diego and arriving at garden centers in North County and arriving all over the place, having gotten up at God knows what time to cross the border as a part of a tide of people that do does this every day. We are in a liminal zone, exactly as if we were a starfish on a beach with a tide washing over us on a daily basis. And I thought, how could we talk about these people without lumping them into this anonymous conversation about immigration, which is frankly so frustrating and so numbing because it's always about numbers. They're never about names. And it feels to me that these are people whose names need to be told, whose stories need to be related, and not simply about whom tweets need to be sent. And so how can you make... <laughs> Pointed comment there. <laughs> how can you make a, a piece of music, which was actually yeah. conceived in another uh, uh, historical period, for other reasons about today? It, because if you can't make it about today, and if you can't make it about here, then why in the hell are we doing it? It has to be about today. And you have to, by the way, I think you have to do that with every bit of art that you do. If it's a dusty museum piece, then you know, eventually it's gonna fall off its pedestal and crack. So that was at least the initial impetus. But when I read the Tijuana uh, Book of the Dead, which I read in a single sitting. And you did? Absolutely, I did wow. not put it down. And it was, to me, an anthem for those people. It starts with a poem you who seek grace from a distracted God the, about someone rising at 4.45 in the morning and finding themselves on Avenue C at 6.45 at a bus stop. And that to me, I thought, oh my God, this is what, this is what we need to be saying. And so first of all, I want to thank you for the extraordinary gift of that poetry. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, and, and also I think there is something ravishing about the spell you cast that is that has as an overlay this music which came from someplace else but still feels to, be, to belong to that issue. Thank you. And besides, you're fantastic on stage. You had nothing to be afraid. You were ah, amazing on stage. Well, I have good ballet moves, I think. You really do. <laughs> um, well, thank you. I, 
You know, one of the points for me is that writing is prayer. And I am absolutely uh, wed to the soul's journey. Mm -hmm. It's a little unpopular now and considered sentimental, but it's true that the soul's journey to eternity, whatever that means. And, um, you know, our relationship to the eternal. Mm -hmm. And uh, that, that interests me. And it breaks my heart that people that I have loved more than anything have felt insulted. You know, with the NEA, for example, going to city after city, um, you know, it, it, it's become outreach to young Latino kids more than anything. I mm -hmm. find myself talking to sometimes 1,200 Raza, mm -hmm. and they're like, you're my first author. You know, you, want, you can retire with that. Yeah. But to think that you can go and see kids who are feeling scared or are feeling embarrassed or ashamed even, and you know, sometimes it's really hard. I, I often go to, to the Aspen area, and there's a town, you know, Aspen, you were talking about the maids. Right. Aspen up on top of the mountain and the town where all the people who attend to them is down valley. It's called Carbondale. Mm -hmm. And every morning, get up early and you'll see people driving maids and cooks and that, that society that's in Carbondale keeps the billionaires alive up in Aspen. Um, but when you go talk to their kids down in Carbondale, they're just kind of like flinching, hmm. particularly because of the rhetoric that has built up. And they did nothing to deserve that. And so my job, I mean, I understand, look at me, I'm the Irish looking Mexican. So when I first walk in, they're like, oh yeah, right. You're Mexican. And they test me. They're like, orale, wey, que onda? Pues aquí echando relajo, wey. That I didn't get, I'm sorry. No. <laughs> I could say. It's inside <laughs> stuff, <laughs> man. Inside stuff. No, but you have to pass a little test. Mm -hmm. But I've realized that we have to pass tests constantly. Constantly. As artists, as people, as men, as women, you know. This is where the border is. The border is not the huge wall right. down in Tijuana. The border is what goes through this room in every direction, every audience. Every audience is ripped apart by border fences. Everywhere I go, black versus white, Muslim versus Christian, gay versus straight, MAGA hats, you know, versus uh, uh, Hillary nasty woman shirts. There are fences everywhere. Yeah. And as a teacher, like you, I teach, you know, um, in Chicago, which is an incredibly segregated city, though nobody will admit it you see those fences in your classroom and you have to do things to overcome it. You have to subvert it. And I think the way to subvert this is through art. Art is dangerous. If art is not revolutionary, it's propaganda. That's right. And the reason, all you need to know is whenever there's a dictatorial takeover of a country, they kill poets really fast. It's because writing is subversive. And so when I'd go to Carbondale and talk to those kids, I had to go as far down the basics of our shared identity as I could. And I would tell them, you don't know you're sacred. And they're like, oh, but it's sacred, man, it's sacred. You know, I'd say, really? What about this? Mm, mm. And they start laughing. Yeah, chale, tortillas, what are you crazy? I'd say, yeah, you don't know that's sacred? Yeah. And then you tell them the history of the tortilla. Mm -hmm. And you say, this food has been perfect for 10,000 years without a change. Not a single change for at least 10,000 years. And then I tell them, how many women do you think have done this over 10,000 years? Yeah. A million, 10 million, 100 million, and how about the men doing it? And you know what, every single time they did this, they said a little prayer for you. And you'd see all the bad dudes be like, damn it. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> you realize all those stories they'd heard their grandparents tell yeah, forever. It was there's a reason those stories are there that people yeah. 
through time are trying to hand you a legacy of sanity, of humanity, and it's, it, it pains me so much that it's been subverted into these, these nets and traps and nuts, yes. and they're exclusionary, when the reality is there is a matrix of our humanity that unites us. There is no them. There's only us. Well, you know, I, I, think, this, I think this is not a non sequitur. Here we go. I'm in. I don't, I don't think this is a non sequitur, but the phrase that makes my blood boil today mm -hmm. is, as the father of daughters, <laughs> dot, right. dot, dot, dot. Right. As though the only reason you could object to the vilification of women is if you had daughters. As a person of this descent, as if the only reason you could object is, it, is, is on the basis of tribal association, when in point of fact, Everyone is the father of daughters, and everyone has roots in Sinaloa, if you want to, if you want to think of it that way. And until we do that, then we really are lost. I saw a wonderful bit of data the other day that 91% of the Americans living in Mexico are illegal. They're undocumented. <laughs> <laughs> what are you going to say? Everybody goes down there on a visitor's visa and buys a little house on the beach, man. <laughs> well, I don't think I could have uh, finished that as well as you just did. And so, if you'll pardon me, I'll say a quick goodbye before we go on to our questions. And uh, this has been a conversation with Luis Orea, and I'm Stephen Schick, and we're very grateful to the Helen Edison Lecture Series, to the San Diego Symphony, and to our intrepid audience for having been yeah, here. Thank, thank you. Thank you so much. Viva Chula Vista!